Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're live. It's funny because today we have a little bit of a new setup. Yeah, we have a little bit of a new setup today. So we're testing a little bit of a more advanced um, producing thing. Hello. Oh, well, no. Uh, <laughs> Sophie's, Sophie's mic's down. So uh, just want to know if people can hear us and if things sound okay and if people see us okay and how that's going. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Us, yeah, we have a little bit of a lag this time because mm -hmm. we're working with a software that enables us to have uh, slides and then Ryan and then back to slides so that we can explain to you how Watermaker work. So I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really fun. I'm super excited for today. Absolutely. So let's just see if everybody can actually hear us. Yay! Hi! <laughs> this is cool. Hello, hello Mickey, hello Bob, hello Fred. I love it. The advanced producing thing is working. We're going to see if it works when we switch to some other shots that we have. But uh, <laughs> for now, this is what we got. So it's really good. There's already seven, 70, 70 of you on here. So that's awesome. Um, before we start today, though, uh, we got a pretty long presentation on water makers. Uh, I hope you guys like it, but we have a little bit of bad news. Uh, and we want to share with our community because maybe you guys can help, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Sophie. Yeah. Uh, today we need to ask for help, which is not something that we normally do. But uh, this morning, when I arrive at the office to edit next week's video, I tried to start my laptop. And long story short, laptop is dead. I am really lucky that we're now in a place where I could get to a repair shop and get the, you know, uh, diagnostic all, all at once. I could repair that laptop, but um, well, it's gonna cost so much that at this point it's not even worth repairing. So I don't have a laptop at this at this moment. So I'm gonna be doing the the comments on the, on my phone. Um, anyways, if those videos have any value uh, to you. There is a function in this chat, uh, in this live, that is called a super chat, in which you can make a, a little bit of a donation. You really don't have to. That normally during those lives, we have about 300 to 400 people that watch at a time. And if half of you gave two to five dollars, that would be a tremendous help for me to continue producing those videos. Uh, obviously, I, I will need to buy a computer uh, because it's it's my whole life it's my whole job so uh, I will take a loan <laughs> um, but if uh, any of you wanted to help you can do that by leaving a, a super chat in this live you can do that there is a little uh, square icon in the chat right by the little smiley icon and uh, and that's it uh, I will I will leave it here um, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, you really, again, you really don't have to do it, but, uh, but if you did, it would, uh, it would mean a lot. <laughs> so now let's talk about water makers. Yeah. I just want to make sure people can still hear us. Some people have been saying that the, um, the audio was a bit echoey. So I'm just playing around with the audio. As we said, we're trying something new. I'm still making sure that it works. So I've lowered something. And if you could just tell me if it's still echoey or what the situation oh, is that thanks would be Matthew. that would be very great uh i think we still have audio so, <laughs> so sorry about this but it's gonna be awesome in the future i have big plans for this this stuff so just make sure that you can still hear us and for those who are wondering we are actually in a new location this is an office that sophie works from and does all of her editing, it seems like people can hear us. So that's, uh, oh, Sophie, you're too, you're too quiet. quiet. Okay. Well, it's we're probably working because on. I'm much farther away from yeah. the microphone than you are. Okay. Um, audio is better now, bit muffled. All right. Well, we're going to just do as best we can here. If you can't hear me, we'll work through it. How about you get the microphone closer to you? Uh, yeah, I just don't know if it's this here. We'll try this. Okay. Oh, that might be better. Um, all right, we're gonna work for this. Um, 
So we're in a new location. This is the office that Sophie works out of. So uh, we're actually kind of in the process of building a big studio here. So we're trying it from here and that's, that's great. So for our water maker session today, let's see if this works. Uh, we're going to go through a, f a few uh, different topics here. We're going to start off with what is an actual water maker so you understand just the basics of it. Um, how does a water maker work? Uh, do you actually need a water maker? We're going to talk you through some steps on if you actually need one. Specifying your system, building a DIY water maker, some maintenance, and Q&A. Uh, questions at the end. So that's what we're going to do. It's going to be a fun day. Um, let's see. So first off, what is a water maker? This is a question I think is like really valuable to ask uh, from the start, because if you just know what it is, you'll, you'll understand what you actually need to maybe build your own system or what you're looking for when you get out there. So a water maker is a really, really simple device. And what all it is, is a big filter that works on the principles of reverse osmosis. And we're gonna talk about what reverse osmosis is here in a second. So it's this reverse osmosis membrane, which is just a really fancy filter, a pressure vessel that houses that reverse osmosis membrane. And then you need a high pressure pump. We need a, a really big pump to force water through that reverse osmosis membrane or that filter and then a way to drive that pump and a water source that's all you need is you need a reverse osmosis membrane and a pump a high pressure pump that's it everything else that you see in these systems is just ways to manage water filter water or clean your water maker when you're done with it so when you're thinking about your your water maker systems this is the very basics this is really all you need. Uh, let's see. Oops. So I said reverse osmosis membrane. What is that? What what principle is that operating? So in nature, there's a thing called osmosis. If we remember back to our chemistry classes, and that's where um, pure water would naturally flow and become salty. So the salt is going to to get into that water through this principle of osmosis. What we're doing in reverse osmosis is we're reversing nature's natural process <laughs> okay so we're like <laughs> we're like trying to like get around nature's process so what we're using is this as you see on this this graph here is using a semi permeable membrane and that's acting as our our reverse osmosis filter and we're using pressure to force that salt water, that contaminated water could be dirty water or salt water, or something with um, contaminants in it. We're pushing it through this semi permeable membrane and out the other side is going to be pure water. So we're going to have two outputs. We're going to have pure water on one side and then the other side is a sludge, like a, a briny discharge that comes out of it. And that's the principle of reverse osmosis. Do we have any questions on that? Nope. No? Okay. <laughs> I'm not a science teacher, so maybe I didn't do that the best, but uh, that's essentially how it works, okay? It's the membrane. It's the membrane, and we use a high pressure pump to kind of reverse nature's... To push water into the membrane. Exactly, yeah. So, oh, 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 sorry. Sophie and I are using the same computer because her computer's dead, so if she... Uh, yeah, I was, I was in a chat. Okay, so the question now is really, do you need a water maker? That's the first thing that you need to ask yourself when you um, are going down this road. Do you need a water? Do you need a water maker? And it's really important with water makers to understand that water makers want to be used. Uh, water makers need to be used in order to be effective. Otherwise, you're just going to be doing a lot of maintenance. So if you're out uh, and you're just a weekend sailor or just going out cruising for maybe a m one month a year, a water maker may not be the best solution for you because you really need to use these things. And there's ways around it, but that, that's the first question to ask. Am I actually going to need this thing? On the flip side of it, if you're a sailor that's out and you're living on board your boat or you have a big family, you always have lots of crew on board, it's a perfect situation 
for um, buying a water maker. No, that's actually a question that we had from okay. Frida. Hi, my husband and I have a boat in Sweden that we use four weeks per year. We we're thinking about going cruising the Met next year. We have three kids and thought maybe a water maker would be good. Yes, uh, not for the four weeks in Sweden, definitely not. But if you're thinking about cruising the Med, do you want to answer that question maybe? Yeah, I think so. If you're going, yeah, so yeah, free to ask a question. Um, you know, I, we're, her and her family want to go cruising the Med. Would a water maker be good? Absolutely, it would be very helpful and beneficial. Uh, part of your thinking when thinking about if a water maker worth, is worth it is also what part of the world you're going to. So in the med, we found it was pretty easy to find water and get water, but what you'll need to do is get off your anchor, go into a marina, or go into a, a harbor where you can actually fill up. Most of the time that was free. Maybe you need to pay for one night at a marina or whatnot. There were it's docks. It's really could, expensive in the med. Could be, yeah, but there were other places you could fill, fill for free. The Caribbean was a little, has been a little bit different. Water is quite expensive. You need to pay for it everywhere you go. Um, and it can be difficult to find good, clean water to drink. So that's another aspect is where you're going. Maybe there's other parts of the world that's just going to be extremely difficult to find water. But if you're going to the Med, you're going to live aboard with a big family. That means you're going to go through a lot of water. Perfect situation to go down the water maker road and, and look at investing into it. Yeah? Yeah. We have a question from Dave who asks if we can take the membrane out of the system when it's not in use, if you only use the boat six months a year. Is that a good question for now or should we it's keep a good, for later? It's a good question. Uh, we can answer it in the maintenance question, but since we asked now, um, those the membranes uh, are not like normal filters that you're going to find, that you're going to find like in just a normal water filter system they are really susceptible they're very sensitive they're pretty high tech if you will so you got to treat them with care and part of that care is they need to be moist all the time they need to be wet if you let them dry out they will um they'll go bad so that's not that's not a solution of just taking them out removing them there is a a maintenance procedure that you can do to make them last for up to about six months uh, we'll talk about it at the end but removing it isn't going to be a a good way, I think. So. Yeah, Tiago asks if water maker needs to be used frequently. How do you handle boats being in the harbor or in storage for months? We're gonna get to that uh, in maintenance parts. Yeah, we have our boat policy in storage at the moment, and we're gonna tell you about how we did. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do that in the maintenance section uh, at the end. So if uh, so, Frida's decided she wants to get a boat in the med. How do we decide what we're even going to get? Because there are a lot of factors to consider. So really what I've got it broken down to is three factors. And I think it's probably important to point out that when Sophie and I, about a year and a half ago, decided uh, maybe we should look at a water maker, we got a little stressed out by the whole thing. Because, of course, you type in water maker on, um, on your google search engine and you know you get the standard spectra type water maker websites and you start looking at the prices and it's like oh man we just how are we going to afford this right and what are we even looking for and what's the size and these things so don't let that stress you we're going to try to <laughs> help you through that process because we were pretty stressed it's stressed especially when we were looking at um the prices Mm -hmm. So three things you really should consider, and I think these are the most important, is the size of your system, how much water, how much should the system produce for you? This is another factor going into water makers want and need to be used. So we'll we'll talk about that here. So uh, you're not talking about the actual physical size of the no, system? No, talking about the production size of the system. How, yeah. as it says in here, how much water per day or per an hour can it can it produce? So that's the first thing you need to start thinking about. Second thing is the power source. How are you going to power your water maker? Uh, and then the third is, okay, once you decide those two, what are you actually going to buy? Are you going to buy an off-the-shelf system, a DIY build-it-yourself type system, or are you going to do like a half system, half DIY, where you kind of get the parts all together and, and build it yourself? Um, Oh, that's a good question. Why not use a classic reverse osmosis unit instead of a special marine filter? 
This is a really good question, especially when talking about what to look for. Um, we get the question a lot, and I see it posted a lot on forums and Facebook of why can't I just go to Home Depot or one of the hardware stores and buy a um, reverse osmosis water maker system that you find in the shop. And the reason for that is those systems, you can't do that because those systems are built for home water supplies. So let's say Sophie and I owned a house out in the woods and we were getting well water that was a little bit dirty. We could use one of these systems to kind of clean that. It's like our own purification system that we'll have in our house. So we can use that to use a reverse osmosis and clean our water for us. Uh, something I didn't mention with the reverse osmosis membranes is they filter such fine particles that it gets all the way down to the virus and bacterial levels. So if we have a well on our property, we could use one of those systems from Home Depot to filter out, you know, bacteria and viruses out of, out of the well water. The problem with salt water, which is what would be on your boat, um, is that when you look at parts per million in terms of particles in the water, uh, or total dissolved solids with well water, water you might be drinking, it might be up to five or 6,000 parts per million. And that's what those systems are designed to do. For salt water, it's up to 30 to 50,000 parts per million. So it's a huge, huge amount more uh, that we need to get out of that water than what those Home Depot systems are. And they're just not capable of doing it. That's partly due to pressure and the, and the size and the power consumption. So, um, that's a good question. So no, those systems, you can try to put it on, but it's not going to work. Your water will still be salty. <laughs> okay. I need to just check here. How, how do you like the fact that we have a presentation at the same time that we're talking? Is that helpful? Is that good? You guys, you guys let us know. <laughs> Cause I think that we're going to be doing those, uh, lives quite a few Sundays this summer. Yeah. And, uh, we want to make them, we want to make them good. We want to, add value. So you guys let us know what you think. <laughs> Absolutely. So size, size is a big question. How big do I need? And you, if you go online, you go into any water maker site, you're going to find that you're going to, you can get all different sizes. You can go from, uh, 15 liters an hour, all the way up to three or 400 liters an hour. And that's a question of how much do you need? Or maybe a question of how much you're using or how much your significant other is using in the shower. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, that's the first question to ask is how much do you need? So for Sophie and I, I, I actually don't know, like what, what do we even use a day? I, I don't even know, but we, I would say like somewhere we're probably using about 50 liters a day. I would say. I can answer that question. I think that having water on a boat is like a woman's purse and sorry, it's super sexist, but the more you have, the more you use. When we didn't have a water maker, I really tried to be conservative with water. I mean, we, we're very conservative with water, but now that we have a water maker, I know that I can afford to um, wash my hair, you know, yeah. a couple of times a week. So yeah, it's... Uh, That's true. It's but if, I mean, question of comfort? it's like electricity, really. So you have two options with electricity or with your water consumption. You can choose to produce more or you can choose to use less. So it's, it's the same with the water maker. Um, if you're using 30 liters a day, you're gonna wanna get a water maker that, that generally works within that 30 liters a day because you're gonna wanna run that water maker maybe every day for an hour or every other day for an hour, maybe every, maybe every third day. And that's probably as far as you're gonna wanna stretch it. So if you're, if you're a person that uses a lot or a, a very minimal amount of water, you may want to have a system that use, that produces a minimal amount of water. So if you're one person on a boat, you may want to go with a smaller size water maker. If you're someone like uh, our question from Frida, who's who's got five people on a boat, you may want to. Um, okay, that's, a bit. this is really distracting. I know. I'm <laughs> sorry. The camera view. Okay, so um, so you're gonna want to plan plan that through and how much you need. So. If, so, as I was saying, someone like Frida, who was um, asking the question with five, she may be using 100 liters a day. So in two days, that's 200 liters. You may want to have a water maker that's capable of producing 200 liters. Um, the other thing is a lot of water makers are rated in 
liters or gallons per day or 24 hour period. And the reality of it is you're not gonna run your water maker for 24 hours, that would just be horrible. Uh, so think of, think of it in terms of one to two hours consumption. We only like to run our water maker between one and two hours a day. Uh, just because the amount of power it uses, and that would be the same for you in, in your thinking. So if you use 200 liters in two days, maybe get a water maker that can do 100 to 200 liters an hour and just run it for one or two hours every other day. So it's kind of the thinking that you should probably think about with, um, with the, the size that you're looking for. Any questions? For that? We have comments. Uh, yeah. Baron said you will use more after your water maker is operational. So at 25% on top of what you use today, I think that's a pretty fair statement, pretty accurate. And nobody says, I think that, <laughs> hi, nobody. <laughs> just for having a margin of safety, just double the expected daily usage. I think those are good points. The other thing to remember, and this we're going to talk about in the maintenance section is after you're done using your water maker, you're going to want to flush it with fresh water. So you're actually, every time you use it, you're going to want to produce a little bit more water than what you actually intend to use for yourself. And that's something to keep in mind also. So you, you need some fresh water to keep the maintenance of the water maker going. Um, and that's, that'll be really valuable for you if you think about that. So that's kind of the, the size and I, I'm, I'm trying not to I'm purposely trying not to give solid numbers because it's going to be for everybody's individual case and we just can't go through everybody's individual case in this amount of time. So it's more of a, a mindset. How much am I going to use in a week or a day or a few days or a month? And then relate that to how big yeah. a water maker I should Let's get. Let's put it this way. Would it make sense for us on Port Seal, which is a 40 foot boat and it's only you and I on board and you know, we don't do a lot of ocean sailing. We have 300 liters uh, capacity in our tanks. Would it mm -hmm. make sense to have like a hundred liters an hour water maker? Well, for us probably, well, we could probably make it work because you just use more but um <laughs> we take, take longer showers but yeah if we if we had a three if we had 300 liter tanks and we had a 300 liter an hour water maker just it wouldn't make sense yeah it'd be silly it feels like a waste of money and yeah we'd run somewhere. it once a week maybe so, so yeah, yeah there is that aspect as well exactly so the next so after you figure out how big a system you want the next thing is how are you going to power this? So there's really four ways to power your water maker and that's through electrical sources. And that can be either through AC alternating current sources, DC direct current sources, um, mechanically, uh, through the engine, that's a mechanical device I could say, or and then I wrote mechanical, but it's actually, when I say that, I mean, mechanical in terms of <laughs> raw force from an energy from yourself. So um, those are the four ways and there's some pros to cons, pros and cons to each. And we're going to run through those here. So AC systems, that is the first one. Uh, and AC pros, one of the big benefits of using AC is it allows for larger systems. So if you're going to want a anything really above 60 liters an hour, you're going to want to have an AC system. Uh, and that's just because the the motors can be a lot bigger, which provides uh, more power for the pump, which then can force water through larger membranes. Uh, and that's that's the reason why. So AC allows for larger systems. The voltage is a bit more stable. Um, and I'll get to that when we talk about DC, but I'll just remember that here is the voltage is a bit more stable and that's good for the motor. Uh, and then the last bit is the wiring can be smaller. So as you're running wires around the boat, can use a much smaller wire because, well, AC voltage is a lot higher. Uh, the cons for it though, and there are some cons for AC, uh, you're either gonna need to, to power an AC unit, you're gonna need a generator or a really large battery bank and an inverter. And there's some expense with that if you do that. So AC is great, but you'll either need to have that generator or a big battery bank. We, Sophie and I kicked around the idea quite a bit because we had just upgraded to lithium we just put on a big inverter and we, we clearly could make that work. Um, but the, in the end, I decided to go with DC partly because of this last con, which is you're going to lose some efficiency in the transfer of energy. So as we go from our batteries, 
which are DC into an inverter, into an AC source. Every time we switch, we lose efficiency. We're gonna talk about that, I think, in some upcoming lives, but that's a, it's a big thing to consider. Um, so you do lose efficiency. So, um, but if you need a big system, that's really what you gotta go with. Do you wanna talk about what we went for and why? Yeah, I will on the next slide, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a little yeah, ahead. Of... We have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh, Bruno asks if we can store the desalinated water and how long you can store it. That's a really good question. Yeah, I'm deciding if I should answer that now. Can you, re can you hold that question for a minute? I will hold it. Okay, question. it's a really good question. Okay, so that's AC. Um, on to DC here. DC... Uh, the pros for DC, and this is actually what Sophie and I decided to go with. We'll get into that here, but the pros for the, it's just a really simple system. I can literally take our batteries, run a wire from our batteries to the DC motor, and it's set. That's all the wiring I have to do. There's no inverter involved. There's no extra cabling. That's it, um, which is the, the second bullet for the, the pros there. Uh, the cons though for it are it's limited output. So I would say the output production of a DC system is around 60 liters an hour. And that's because they really don't make a lot of DC motors over one horsepower. And at that one horsepower limit with the, the high pressure pump, you can really only get the water at the proper PSI uh, through a single membrane, which will limit you to, well, about 60 liters an hour. <laughs> um, another con to it though, is because it's a very large DC motor, it requires a lot of power to operate. And that requires pretty large cabling, especially if your batteries are, or your power source is on one side of the boat and your motor is on maybe the other side of the boat. So the longer the length for those cabling, the bigger it's gonna have to be. And um, well, that creates a pretty big expense when installing and it can be a bit difficult to actually run those big wires around. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, the voltage can be a little bit irregular and we've experienced this a little on polar seal. So let's say we're running our water maker and then all of a sudden we turn on another uh, high power device, the voltage is gonna drop a little bit and we can hear that in our motor. So you get sometimes these, these different sound uh, variations as we go along and it's not always the nicest and it kind of makes you question <laughs> if the water maker is working right. So we had a really good comment from uh, Eric, and Eric said that, uh, well, he, he's in the US, so they oh, contain gallons. I think that uh, would be nice to talk about liters, but also about gallons. The best way I can try to do that mathematically in my head, the best way is whatever I talk about, just divide by four. That's the liters to gallon, roughly, unless we start talking about empirical and standard, and yeah. <laughs> I'll try to remember to do that, though. Okay, so we've talked about two electrical sources, which is AC and DC. Um, then we get into a more interesting one, which you don't see as much out there, but it's worth noting because it is an option, and that's using your engine um, to power the pump. So um, the pro to this is that you don't need any batteries, you don't need a, any generators, you don't need any additional cabling. What we literally are doing is taking a pump and attaching it to the pulley system on our engine. So not sure how you can see in this photo, but, uh, or my mouse, but there's the engine block here. And then down at the bottom of this photo is a high pressure oh, that's right. pump. And uh, it's just got a big wheel on the, the front of it there. And that's attached to the belt system, just like you would attach your water pump for your motor or the, the uh, alternator through a belt. It's the same thing. Um, so it's good in that sense, it doesn't require power, but in the same time, the cons to it be, can be extremely complex to put together. I think all of us boaters, or if you're not new to boating, you're gonna find out soon, there is no room in those engine compartments. So to find additional space for a water pump or even another piece of equipment you need to work on, take some planning. Uh, but if you don't have a big battery bank or you don't have room for a generator, this could be a good solution for you, especially on a, a smaller boat. Um, and so it just adds complexity. You also need to have your engine running while you're 
making water. So if you use a lot of water, that engine's gonna, you're gonna be putting more wear and tear, you're gonna be doing more oil changes. It gets loud, it gets hot. Th these are all things to consider. So um, yeah, if, you're, if your boat is like ours, it's like living in a tractor, in a tractor when the <laughs> engine is on. We have some really good comments here. Uh, SV Catching Ray says, I tried the 12 volt way, did not work well. AC is the way to go. Just run the generator for a short time and make lots of water. Yes, that's great if you have a generator. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, well, I think we get into the ACDC discussion here in a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, people have tried it both ways. I know people that have tried engine driven ways. They've said, ah, don't do it, it's too complex. They go back, DC, going back to AC, back to DC. So, um, well, I guess to each their own on that one. Yeah, we have, we're have we having lots of good questions here. Do you want to take them or do you want to continue a little bit? Uh, let me just do the last one and we'll we'll take some more. Okay, so that's the engine journey. The last one, which is, is always a fun one, is, is a purely mechanical uh, system. So I have a photo here and this is a, um, Kadine, it's almost like a rescue water maker that you have and maybe a grab bag uh, in case you need to ditch. Uh, but uh, these are systems you essentially just pump that handle. If you're, you're the high pressure pump and you force water through those hoses and out the other end comes clean water. It's great because it requires no electrical power. It's a really simple system and there's very few parts with it. Uh, and it's really good as a backup system. So especially if you need to to ditch and you want to have, you, th you think you're gonna be floating around for a while. Uh, but in reality, it's not, this is not a system that you would want to have on board to um, make water on a daily basis. It, it requires a lot of effort. Imagine pumping for an hour just to produce maybe one liter, two liters, because that's about all they produce. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to get a little bit of water. So. I think I, the, the frequency at which I wash my hair would uh, drastically reduce mm. if I had to pop every time. Yeah, they, they really are great, um, great devices as a, as a backup. So um, that's, that's good. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's the second bit. So um, maybe, maybe just worth talking about um, Hold on, I need to go to the next. Yeah, it's maybe worth just talking about what we decided to do with ours. So as I said, we, we ended up going with the DC system and it was really for simplicity's sake on our boat. We just wanted to keep it simple. I didn't want to have, have the system run through an inverter, uh, which if the inverter failed, I then couldn't run the water maker. So I just kept it simple on the DC side. There are times I've considered maybe it's worth just replacing the pump and making it AC and then we could add an, another membrane if we ever wanted. But uh, there's a bit of expense to that and cost and I just haven't gotten there. So we went with DC just because we didn't think we needed more than 60 liters an hour and, um, and knew that we could change to an AC system if we needed to. And that's one of the awesome benefits of make a DIY system and doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of how to select a system in a nutshell. And maybe, I don't know if there's some questions related to that, Sophie, that we could to like selecting a system, selecting a system. Well, there, we have a few questions. Okay. Eric asked if they were noisy water makers. <laughs> that's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah. Ours is a bit noisy. Um, I haven't tried a, a lot of that bad, though. No, it's not. If you had it inside your boat, it could be a bit annoying and loud, but... Uh, it's probably 25% of the noise our engine produces. Yeah, I'd say that's good. We hear it running, but it's not too distracting no. and it's outside. Most of, most of the... Think of it this way. If you've ever been by an industrial pressure washer that, that is hosing off trucks or maybe at the, the do-it-yourself pressure like car washing place those are industrial pressure washers and the pumps that power those are the exact same pumps that we're describing here so if you can think of what the noise of that is that's the noise that you would have and then you just gotta consider that it might be in a compartment which might muffle it a little bit um so in general yeah it's kind of the sound of a pressure washer okay then we have questions about the power 
so Bayrand says, I like to align solar and the water maker. It's not a question, but it's a comment. 30 liters per hour DC is cheaper and sufficient for a two, 3% household. So when you're in a sunny area, you can run it for a few hours quietly. Uh, yeah. That's basically what we do. Yeah, exactly. That's what we do. So um, we're going to have some more lives on thinking about how to think about your energy needs on board. But one of the one of the techniques that we use is we let the solar kind of top up the batteries through the day. And if we're at a place where that solar is um, pumping it, power. Pump, well, if if our batteries are a hundred percent, so let's say some some boats might get their batteries topped up by by noon or one o'clock. From that point on, th that solar is just going to waste. So there's no reason why you can't just turn the water maker on, let that run, and chew away at some of that solar. So that's exactly what we do, and it's a good thing to think about when putting on a, a water maker uh, and, and solar maybe at the same time. So yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, nobody asked if the water maker being such a power hog. I'm wondering if we should calculate your water needs, then double the capacity of the water maker. So pick the water maker and then figure out the power source. Yeah, that's that's kind of a chicken and egg thing. I've thought about that before too. The best the best way I've thought about. Um, so I think really the question is, the water makers use a lot of power, and that's true. Unless you have a, a special. <laughs> Unless you have a specific type of pump, which is called a Clark pump or an energy recovery pump, and they use a lot less power. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but if you're just using a standard pressure washer pump and a membrane, they do use a lot of power. So for instance, on Polar Seal, uh, we use roughly between 50 to 60 amps at 12 volts to, to produce that power, uh, to produce water, 60 liters an hour. Uh, what is that? 20. Uh, 60 liters an hour. It's it's about 16, 16 gallons, gallons. 16 gallons an hour. Um, so if I then, so a good way to to take that is take 60 liters an hour, and take the watts uh, that is required for an hour. So if it's, oh god, now I got to do math in my head. Well, anyways, you can do the math. Uh, say take your 60 amps times 12, and that gives you your watts. So. Uh, whatever that is. <laughs> okay, now I'm embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I'm sweating a little because I'm so embarrassed. Um, because you can't do math in your head. No. It's okay, I don't think that you're the only one. 720 watts. Uh, so what you can essentially get is how many watts is required per liter to produce, okay? If I add another membrane to my system, I could, as as he says, essentially cut the, cut the time my water maker needs to be running in half. Um, but not really because I'm going to need a bigger pump because I need to add another membrane to the system. So I'm going to need a bigger pump, which is going to require more wattage to power. It might be an AC pump, probably will be an AC pump. And uh, that could, that's going to, okay, that got a little messy with the light, honey. So, um, that, it did. Sorry. so that's how to think of it. Um, is look at how much watts it takes per liter. So I found that it didn't really matter if we were at 60 liters, just a single membrane and running it for an hour versus making it bigger. The only exception to that is that I really need that water, uh, but that's it. I hope yeah. that made sense, I don't know. Sorry for the light situation, guys. This is live. You see everything happening directly. Uh, should we take a few questions? Yeah. All right, uh, here is a good one. So we, Ryan, are you considering a bigger battery bank, 600 amp hour or so? <laughs> uh, we actually have a, we have about 680 amp hour battery bank. So that's, that's what makes this work on DC is that we do have a pretty sizable lithium battery bank, which allows us to pump out that power so quickly uh, and then use it on the water mm -hmm. maker. Yeah. Uh, so that would be my suggestion too. You need a probably for a, a system like ours, a pretty good size battery bank on DC to make it make it work. Anything else there? Yeah, uh, Heidi and Fernie were wondering if you had two smaller systems, maybe you'd have redundancy. So what about having two smaller systems instead of a one bigger system? What do you feel about well, that? Well, uh, that's a good question. I think there's there's val there's something to be said about redundancy. 
Because uh, even you and I, when we were on lockdown in St. Martin, we had a few days where the water maker was acting up and it got a little stressful because we were like, well, <laughs> what are we going to do if this thing doesn't work? Because um, we, where are we going to get the water from? But, and on the flip side of that, you have then two systems to maintain and run. And as I said before, the membranes, the reverse osmosis membranes want to be used. So you'd have to run one water maker one day, one the next, and keep switching it to keep them used. You couldn't just keep uh, one system unless you just kept it mothballed with no filters in it on the side. So I, I think it's, it's almost a little bit overkill, uh, but when we talk a little later here about how to build more DIY system, um, yeah, well, you'll understand why it's good to do that because you can just keep some spares aboard and that's almost like your second, second system. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had, never, I had never thought about having two smaller systems either. I guess I would hate I would hate right. maintaining it because there is some maintenance you need to do, and I just don't want to think about two systems. Yeah, that's right. I don't know. Maybe for a catamaran it would work. It would be fine. I don't know. I would keep it with one and just keep it a simple system and and keep some spares on board. That'd be my recommendation. But that's just me. You can do what you want. <laughs> Thanks for the questions, guys. They're yeah. awesome. Somebody asked us, uh, is cereal soup? Which is a question. A little off topic, but uh, maybe we can address that a little later. Is cereal soup? Mm -hmm. It's deep. <laughs> it was in oh, I'm man. joking. Let's continue. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. So, so now what we've done is decided, okay, do we need a water maker? Yes or no? How big is that water maker? Uh, what is going to power that water maker? And then the last question is really, how are we going to buy that water maker? Are we going to, are we going to buy it off the shelf, uh, from a, a name brand manufacturer? Are we going to build it ourselves, which you all can do. It's not very hard. I'll walk you through that today. Or are we going to use kind of a, an ad hoc system where we buy the parts maybe from somebody and, and still have to build it ourselves, but at least we know we have all the parts. Uh, and there's, there's a few pros to this. I'd say, you know, and I didn't make slides for this, but if you're buying something off the shelf, it's great because you get a name, hopefully you get some reputation. And in some cases, like a, a company like Spectra, you get a little bit more efficiency out of the pumps. So Spectra uses a thing called a Clark pump or an energy recovery pump. And essentially what that does is in order for the membrane to do its reverse osmosis job, we need to have the pressure in there at 800 PSI. So we're pushing water through our membrane at 800 PSI and then out the other end is going to be fresh water and brine water. Maybe you want to have that slide so that people understand what you're talking about when you're referring yeah, to Yeah, but I don't, I don't want to get people confused. So you're going to have fresh water and brine water. And with that brine water that comes out, it's still got a little bit of pressure in it. So what they do with these Clark pumps is that comes back into the pump and it kind of helps or assists um, in getting that pressure back up to 800 PSI. So the the motor, the, the pump motor doesn't have to work so hard. That then allows for um, you to use less electrical energy when producing fresh water. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons you pay a lot of money with brands like Spectra um, in their water maker systems. But those pumps are also proprietary and have proprietary parts in them. So if they break, it can be a big ordeal. We knew some people in St. Martin during the lockdown that they had problems with their Clark pumps and getting parts was like massive, massive ordeal. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that's one option. You can do that. There's some good customer service and support you hope uh, when you buy it, but uh, also the cost is, is pretty substantial. The other option is a DIY system where you literally just go out, you find a high pressure pump, you find a membrane, you find a reverse uh, osmosis um, membrane and pressure vessel. I guess I just said that. And then all of the, the hosing and connectors and all that garbage. Yeah. And I guess um, we thought about making a list and I think that they exist on the internet, like a list of all parts that you need to get with links uh, to buy them. But you guys come from everywhere in the world, use different me uh, metric units. Yeah. So it would be completely impossible for us to um, provide with such a list. But there is this little graph that is super helpful that we're going to put up on our website at the end of this live, where you can see all the parts that you need to buy, all of those parts you can find at a hardware store. 
uh, or online and you can as Ryan said just buy whatever fits your needs the um, uh, metric units or how do you call it measure units yeah man my English is bad tonight <laughs> um that you need or want or are adapted for your boat yeah your country yeah and that's a good point i mean sophie's talking about the parts i mean so you can build it yourself and that does take a lot of time to do because you got to go on the internet you got to find something you're questioning to yourself like is, is this the right pump like is this the right motor i have no idea i've never done this before like is this the right pressure vessel like i don't know metric i'm in the u.s yes. <laughs> so um that's and that's where uh a, like a, a company that does kind of semi DIY solutions that essentially provides you the parts and then you build it is good. Um, and that's where we bought ours from. And I'll just give a little plug to Seawater Pro uh, that, well, we bought our kit through them yeah. and, and the guys who run that have just been, Mike has just been awesome in helping us. And Have we talked about uh, kits that you can buy, like buying parts versus buying the kits? Well, I was just speaking about okay. that right now. So, yeah. Um, so. Just talking about how we built our system of built, I built this awesome graph for all of you to see. <laughs> it was built in an amazing program called PowerPoint, uh, which you can probably tell. Did you make but, it yourself? Yeah, I made wow, this, I I made this it. myself. It actually took a while because I had to, you know, make shapes and wow, different things. I'm impressed. Anyways, I'm just going to walk you through how we designed our system, why we did it this way. And then if you want, I think we can ask questions as we go along the little parts. Um, and like the water tank questions and things, and that'd be good. Uh, so the first bit here is you're going to need some type of inlet. I, I hope people can see my mouse. I think you can see it going, but you're going to need a seawater inlet. Now there's a lot of debate on if that inlet should be dedicated to your water maker system, or if you should tap off of it, um, like through something else, maybe your, your some inlet for the engine that's what some people do uh you know whatever we had a seawater foot pump inlet that was just the right size that we used uh, if you were to ask me i would be more apt to use a dedicated through haul for your water maker versus uh tapping like off an engine line a lot of people do that off the engine seacock um, and in my view that that seacock and that water line there is so important for the engine that i just wouldn't want to do that but it is something you can do so um that's the first thing i need is a is some type of inlet to, for water uh probably also important to note there is another company called rain man that makes uh, like portable water makers and essentially it's just like a portable system with a membrane and a pump and you literally just take like a hose and just <laughs> like put it in the water next to you so you wouldn't need a seacock inside you could just make it a little diy in that sense and just drop a drop a hose in the water uh, some type of a line in the water and it could suck it up so you wouldn't need uh, a seacock so the next thing then is it needs to go to some type of strainer. And this is just a strainer, just like on your engine that is going to remove like shark poo or seaweed or I don't know, jellyfish, things like that. It's just taking off like the big stuff that's floating around in the water uh, and putting that. And that's really important because the next piece here is a low pressure pump. So if we have a bunch of crap in the water and it gets into a low pressure pump, it's going to just cause the whole system to stop. And that's what that seawater strainer is there for to prevent that from happening. So the next bit then that we have in our system, at least is a low pressure pump. Now, the reason you need this is that if any part of your water maker system is above the water line, you're going to need a way for, well, the seawater to get to those parts, which are above the water line. So a lot of production boats these days, it's almost impossible the way that the bilges are constructed to keep the entire water maker system below the water line. Older boats or maybe boats like ML's uh, with maybe deep bilges, you could fit all those parts down there, but with production boats, you can't. So that low pressure pump is there. It is a necessity. You do need to have it. You should plan on it in terms of your power, uh, power what's the word i'm looking for pressure no your power your power consumption so it's it's also the low pressure pump and the high pressure pump you got to think about um there 
So next you're gonna go, the water is then gonna flow up and go into this section that we call pre-filters. Uh, every system, you're gonna buy an off-the-shelf system, make your own system, they need to have some type of pre-filter before it gets into the RO membrane. Our system has two, we have two filters in there. One of them is a 20 micron filter, and then the other one is a five micron filter. And what that means is that in the 20 micron filter, anything that's above 20 microns in size, and it's still very small, is gonna get stopped by the filter. Anything less than 20 microns in size is gonna pass through and go to the next stage. So 20 micron filter first, and then we go to a five micron filter, which is the same thing. It's just, we've, we've lowered the, the size of particulate that can pass through. Um, yeah, I think with the setup I really like because when we were in the really dirty water in the lagoon in St. Martin, the 20 micron filter got dirty pretty often and we, we had to keep changing that. But that five micron filter was, I would say, it was, I don't know if you ever saw it, but it was pretty clean and white and still yeah, looked good. I'm sorry, I've, I've lost a thread here. Um, oh. We, uh, guys, thank you so much for those super chats. Like, I'm actually, <laughs> I can't cry. Don't make me cry. Uh -huh. um, thank you. If for you who uh, joined us a little later after we started, my laptop died this morning and uh, it's, it's not salvageable. I need a new one. It's really not an expense that uh, we could afford right now. So thank you so much for your help. I cannot cry <laughs> because this is live. I cannot just lose it. <laughs> no, but thanks guys. But thank you. That's great. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, you're doing great, honey. So these three filters are the next thing and, and they are really important because that reverse osmosis membrane is really, really sensitive. It's sensitive to like big particles going through it, it's sensitive to the type, like any chemicals that are in the water, if there's any oil in the water. Uh, and so those pre-filters are gonna help prevent that and create, uh, allow that reverse osmosis membrane to last longer. That's the reason they're there. Uh, the next thing we have in our system is a pressure gauge, low pressure gauge. and that's really just an indication that for us, at least on our boat, that water is flowing. And, um, and if something gets clogged up, we might see the pressure drop way down, or if something's going super crazy wrong and pressure might go way up. So it's just an indication for us. And you're going to learn in your system, what looks normal and what doesn't. Uh, one thing I have done in our system, which I don't have indicated here is with the low pressure pump, I actually created a I wish I would have drawn it on here, but I created a bypass of the pump. And what was happening uh, originally with our system was that on the low pressure side, it was the pressure was actually really high. It was like 40 or 50 PSI. Um, and that was causing our pump to overheat and then shut down sometimes. So what I did was create, we created uh, with the help of Mike at Seawater Pro, we created the bypass valve um, and it has a little screw on it so I can open and close it as much as I want. And that allows me to like lower the pressure um, in the low pressure side if I need to, if you know we have a different filter that's acting a little weird or something. Um, and, but generally I just set that, I don't have to mess with it every time and it's just there, but it's probably worth noting. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Up, up we have time? lots of questions. Uh, do you want to up to this point? Anything with this stuff? Do you, no, you know? not okay. not related to what you have said so far. But we have a lot of questions that we are okay. going to need to address. Cool. Uh, I'll just keep going, and then we'll take some of those. So after those pre filters, we're going to get into a high pressure high pressure pump. So this is the pumps we were talking about. The, this is the one of the main ingredients of the system, and really all it is is an industrial pressure washer pump. That's, that's all it is. And a, and a motor behind it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty simple. Just got to go find one stainless steel one, uh, or whatnot. So it goes there. And then now we got to change lines up until this point, all, you'll see all the lines in the system have been blue. And these can just be any type of water line, just low pressure line that you have in your house water system on the boat. Are they food grade? Uh, up until this point, I guess they should be food grade. Mine haven't been because they haven't entered the reverse osmosis membrane yet. 
and that's going to clear all that crap out anyways. So okay. I haven't done that, but oh. yeah. Um, so after the high pressure pump, you're going to need to have a special high pressure hose. If you take just a normal house water hose and connect it in here, it's just going to explode. We have, we have eight to 900 PSI coming out of the high pressure pump. And so you need to have a pump. I think our, our line is rated to 3000 PSI in some industrial line and it's connected with the appropriate fittings uh, and then goes to, well, the membrane, the pressure vessel. But it's the only place where you need it, where you need a high pressure hose line. Uh, yes, we'll talk about one exception to that, but yeah, in this hmm. system, how it's drawn, yeah. Okay, so then you have your reverse osmosis membrane and the pressure vessel. Uh, and it's really important to get a good pressure vessel and fittings for that and attach. I'm not going to get into that. You can talk to a supplier about what might be good or not, but you can just do it an internet search for reverse osmosis membrane and pressure vessel, and you'll find all kinds of options out there. One thing I will say is that there are many, there are many types of reverse osmosis membranes out there. There's not many manufacturers. Dow is the biggest one. Uh, I think there is one other one, but it's primarily one, two manufacturers. But they make a different series of membranes. They have a general saltwater membrane. They have one for colder climates. They have one for more Baltic, uh, brackish climates, uh, you know, for water that you're in. So if you're going to be in one part of the world for a while, let's say you're just cruising the Baltic, uh, it's not salty here. You may want to get a, a RO membrane that is suited or designed specifically for that environment. If you're cruising around the world, you may want to ask a distributor, you know, what is the most general membrane for you? And, and that's going to uh, be your best bet. But just note that there are different types of membranes. That's actually, yeah, someone asked us if uh, you could use a water maker in fresh water. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, you could. Um, you won't need a lot of pressure because uh, there's not a lot of salt in it. So. Yeah, I suppose you could. We run a f freshwater flush, and I guess if you cranked it up a little bit, it would just take out some of the viruses and bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Never <laughs> really thought of that. All yeah, right. I guess if doomsday is coming, I mean, this is exactly what you need just to clean. And this is what they use these a lot in Spain. We saw a lot of these reverse osmosis like house units, which we talked about at the beginning. Um, and they, they're just there to like purify and clean water, just normal like well water. So, yeah. That's a good question from Jules. Bigger membrane container and membrane, bigger membrane container and membrane is better or just more expensive? I guess you're going to produce more water. Uh, yeah, you'll produce more water with once. a more pump, but it's only better if you need the water. Because if you, if you buy a bigger thing, you're like, oh, I only have to run my water maker once a week for an hour because I don't use that much water. It's a bit silly to, to invest that money into it because the water maker wants to be used. It doesn't want to you don't want to use it because you don't want to hear it all week, but the water maker does. And this is the thing you're investing in and something that is actually pretty vital for you to live. So I wouldn't say bigger is always better, but if you need it, it is. So that's again, assessing what your needs are and determining how big it should be. All right. ACM. Um, do you always have bottled water in case water maker breaks? Yes, we do. Yeah, we, we do. We always carry bottled water with us, uh, which is, it's not great. I don't feel really good about it. But uh, in case something happens, we, we need those bottles. And we don't always do that. But when we crossed the Atlantic, we had uh, jugs of five liters. We had five jugs of five liters. And when we were on lockdown and we weren't sure how much we could access the supermarkets, we also had bottled waters, uh, bottles of water for us. Yeah. Uh, okay. What is the capacity in gallon per minute of your water maker pump and what PSI is required to force water through the membrane? Yeah. So most of the RO membranes for salt water require 800, 850 PSI. Any more, you're going to damage the membrane. Any less, you're not going to be able to um, get enough of the total dissolved solids out of the water to make it safe for you to drink. Uh, so that's the thing. Ours, ours produces, well, he was asking how much it produced. Yes. So for a single membrane at 800 PSI on a DC system, we produce about 60 liters an hour, which is around 
anywhere between 15 to 17 gallons an hour, depending on the day. I haven't quite figured out why that varies some days. I'm still playing with that. I'm sure someone smarter than me knows, maybe even somebody watching, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's what you need there. Yeah. I, it's, I saw a question just come up while I peered over a second ago, and it's maybe worth just saying it. This is a really simple system, how I have it mapped out here. It's what it's it's pretty much exactly how we have it designed on our boat with a few exceptions. Um, but a lot of off the shelf water makers are, if you look at them, cause somebody just said they, they've had one on their boat for six years and it's so complex when they look at it. And it's true. I've looked at a lot of off the shelf systems on other people's boats. And there's like sensors and gauges and different pressure relief valves and, and things. And that's a lot of over-engineering. And part of that is because these companies design them so that they can be on anybody's boat and that person doesn't need to think about it. And then if something does break, they have to call in somebody that actually knows a really complex and technical system. So they can be really complicated, but the point of us doing this live and to talk to you about it is to show that it doesn't have to be the only things that you need is salt water, a high pressure pump and a membrane, and then just a, man a way to manage the water. That is all you need. Everything else in these systems is just way like different safeguards. So customers don't screw up the system, but in reality, it, <laughs> it just causes more problems. So, um, this is, this is the basic system. It's, it's just worth how much did our system cost this or how much would that system cost right now? Uh, I think we paid just like when we bought all the stuff and, and because there is what we paid for our kit, and then there is what we paid, you know, in extra parts or yeah, I bought a bunch of extra we... stuff and yes. different, uh, yeah, wa hoses and wires and things. I don't know. I'd, I'd say I probably paid about twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, maybe I didn't do a good job of keeping track, but that's that's probably yeah. Um, okay, so if we go here, so we have the RO membrane, and then th this is where things split, and we get. This is where the magic happens. So now we've got fresh water, actually. You could like pull the hose out and just have fresh water like flowing into your mouth if you wanted. Um, so That's the, gonna happen during the install though. Yeah, that well, we'll talk about that. So um, the briny discharge, this is the this is the water that's come. So there's water that's gonna come out of two places of the membrane. One is fresh water, and that's the line on the bottom, the blue line. The other one is a briny discharge, and that's like, super salty water so it's a little bit of water and you know a whole bunch of salt uh, so i i used to know the number i forget what it is but for every like gallon you put in of water you're only going to get like maybe 20 or 30 percent out of actual fresh water the rest is just this briny discharge that's coming out um and that briny discharge that's coming out is actually how we control the pressure in the membrane so that output, so there's gonna be, you need to have some type of gauge there telling you what the pressure coming out is. But then you also need to have some type of a control valve that can control that. And that control valve needs to be, can't just be a plastic control valve. It's, you know, 800 PSI coming out. It needs to be a very well engineered um, valve. And you can either buy those online or you can get that through a maybe a DIY kit part procurement thing. Um, or if you're really handy with a CNC machine, you could do it that way. Uh, but that's controlling the pressure, so it's on that side. And then that brine discharge just goes over the side of the boat, uh, out into the water, and the fishies, fishies like. The fresh water then uh, goes out, and that goes, we have it connected to a flow meter, uh, and that flow meter is just telling us how many gallons per hour, or it could be whatever unit you need that we're getting out of there. Uh, and then it goes to a uh, TDS meter, total dissolved solid meter. And thank you for everybody in the world in our video that we put out about this correcting me because I kept saying TSD meter. I think once a month I get correct on that. Um, so TDS, total <laughs> dissolved solids. And this is a meter that's telling us how many solids are in the water. And the World Health Organization has a, a scale for this. I don't actually know. It's right standard. Off, it, I don't know that all the particulars off the top of my head, but essentially anything above a thousand parts per million kind of that water is unsafe to drink. It's not considered potable water. Anything less than that is. Um, and then there's different grades. Of it. So anything above, uh, sorry, below 500 is considered good. Anything below 100 is considered excellent. So this is what you get. Um, typically, 
for us, we typically see about 120 parts per million uh, coming out. And I know a lot of people judge the health of their RO membranes based on that. So if you've had your membrane for a number of years and you start, you can't get it below 400, 300, 400, you know that maybe the thing's getting old, maybe you can flush it out, clean it out. Um, but that TDS meter is telling you how many parts per million of dissolved solids you have coming out. So, yeah, do you have a question? No? Um, no. It's not related to that, but we do have lots of questions and they're okay. very interested. Well, we're almost done here. So I'll, I'll get through this and then we'll take it. So that TDS meter, so we have that then, although not today, but that's another story, connected to a three-way valve. And the purpose of that is so that you don't put bad water in your tanks. So the idea is that that three-way valve allows the water to flow to a testing tap that could be on your kitchen sink, it could be in the bathroom sink, it could be, I don't know, and to the person you don't like's bedroom, under their pillow, uh, but it, it's just a testing tap. So you can see, and it, sometimes it takes a while for that TDS value to come down after you turn the water maker on. So once you see it blow like 500 and you say, okay, the water is good. I've maybe tested it, tasted it, it tastes good. Then you can flip it over and then the water can go uh, into the into your fresh water tanks. And that's exactly, well, we removed the three-way valve, but that's just because I haven't, we we added the panel and I haven't re-engineered it yet, but that's how I would prefer the system to be set up. Just so you have some control over what goes into your tanks and what doesn't. The other thing that's not depicted on here is on Polar Seal, we actually have two fresh water tanks. And when we fill the tanks, I don't typically allow the water maker to fill both tanks at the same time. It's one tank or the other tank, and that also prevents uh, contamination in the system. So if we do get something happens and we didn't realize and we're getting bad water into one tank, we at least have another tank that's good. Uh, and that's just, it's just my own thing that I do, but it's something to, to think about if you have that, that option. Yeah, and that's really how to make water with the water maker and how we've set up our system. Uh, is it, does it make sense guys? Is it something that's uh, understandable and, uh, and does it make sense? And do you feel that after that you could build your own water maker? We have some really good questions related to the installation of the water maker. And I think that one of them is how important. Hold on. Sorry, honey. Oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, so we were just talking about TDS and I just saw a question come up and I think it's a really good one to talk about. This one? STD uh, meter? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so no, the question was, what if the water is too pure? So below like 10 parts per million. And I have never seen 10 parts per million. I have never heard of anybody getting 10 parts per million. But it is worth noting that the reverse osmosis membrane takes everything out of the water. So it's taking salt out, it's taking viruses out, it's taking bacteria out, but it's also taking out uh, minerals that our bodies actually need to survive. So when we drink water from the tap, we're not just drinking pure water. We're drinking, there's a little bit of iron. There's some, I don't know, I guess there's some coppers. It's all kinds of like minerals in there that we need. And so if your only source that you're gonna drink for like a year out of this reverse osmosis membrane, uh, sorry, out of your water tap is from this water maker, it may be worth putting a, uh, like a remineralization kit in your system, like going from your freshwater tank into a drinking water tap. Um, and we have a specific tap on board our boat uh, just for drinking water and it goes through a carbon filter and, and this and that. But you you could do that. You could have it um, in, they have they spell, sell special kits where it puts minerals back in the water and it makes you healthy and so you don't die because you, you can actually drown yourself if water's <laughs> too pure. So th I think that's a good question is that it does take all the minerals then ask if we need to take any vitamin or mineral supplements while living on i think that we we never do because we drink bottled water from time to time yeah so it kind of uh okay should we go back to all those questions that we've been having you yeah like? i think so yeah <laughs> okay um i really like this one uh, blah, blah, blah. oh man, I've, I've lost it. I'm sorry guys. I'm a little, today I'm doing all the chat from my phone because, because there is no computer anymore. Uh, nobody asks how important is placement of the system in relation to heat, power supply, yeah. storage and location. That's an awesome question. Where to put 
That's a good question. I've seen them put pretty much everywhere. Um, you got to think through a lot of different things. We had a friend install one with a control panel and he thought he was being smart by putting the control panel like low on the bottom of the SETI, but he also has four kids and a kid's like sometimes playing and they flip the switches and all of a sudden the water maker's on. So that's one thing, uh, you know, like who's going to get access to the panel? Is it your cat? Um, and you're going to come home and the water maker's running, but, uh, like relationship to heat and stuff, the pump and the motor are pretty heavy. So you're going to want to make sure that's secure somewhere. And what I did is put it in our garage and I, um, bolted it down and I also kind of blocked it off so that nothing can really, uh, fall on. It has good airflow. You're going to want that because it will get hot. The motor's running for maybe an hour or two, but also so something like doesn't fall on it and maybe overheats or starts a fire. Mm -mm. So that would be something I'd think about. Other than that, uh, placement is just kind of what's convenient and what's available for you. And that's, that's really one of the benefits of this 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 uh graph i have here for you is that you can place anything where you want as opposed to a spectra system that's just like all contained unit you got to find a big chunk of space that will fit that um so yes and the water line considering the water line yeah exactly if you don't want to have a an extra pump yes so uh Ryan said a little earlier that when on most production boat, it's really difficult to uh, place your water maker below the water line. So before uh, your high pressure pump, you want to install a low pressure pump so that water can run up into the next parts of the water maker. Uh, if your boat is deep enough that you can get all parts of the water maker below the water line, then you're fine. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm sorry. Da. Okay. Oh, this is that was a good story for you. Uh, I'll keep it. I'll keep it for later. Uh, what's the total current draw on a daily basis with our system? Yeah, with our system, and we're running a DC system with a one horsepower motor and a 40 inch membrane, which is kind of the standard kit. Uh, we use anywhere between 50 to 60 amps on a 12 volt system. Uh, per yeah 50 it, that's what it's pulling so in an hour we're using 60 amp hours um and some people think it's a lot i used to think it was a lot but what we're getting from it is really, it's really good so um yeah and, you know that power is going to go lower like the the amp hours is going to go lower if you put in an ac motor but the wattage is still going to remain pretty similar so it's still the same draw from the batteries. And a lot of times it's even more because you have to convert DC to AC. So, um, but it only works with that 140 inch membrane. Um, I haven't tried it with two. I've been told it doesn't work very well if you try to put two on DC system. So that's when you'd want to upgrade it, but that's. All right. Hi Dave and Franny ask if we ever need a, de a deionizer after the membrane. I've heard of people putting deionizers on, I guess. What is it? I'm not even sure. It's I, takes I don't know. Ion, ion, ions out of water or something. I have no idea what know. this is. Can you? So I don't know. But can I do you know, enlighten us in the in the chat? I do know people have said they put deionizers on. I've never understood what some people do though. Uh, is as we said, put remineralization uh, yes. filters on. They're not a filter. It's actually adding it back in. Uh, and then other people will also put a UV light source there. Um, to kill anything else, but all the bacteria and viruses are, are essentially out of the water once it passes through that membrane. Uh, and I think you had a question earlier, honey, about how long to store water in the water tanks. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So essentially the water is really pure. It's really clean. It's really good. It's better than most public drinking water sources after it comes out of that membrane, that 40 foot membrane on your own boat. Where it's gonna get contaminated is if, if the water lines um, oh, you're, okay. uh, you're trying if, to use if, the mouse. If where it's going to get contaminated is if the water lines or the water tanks are contaminated. So we we kind of are on a schedule every six months. We try to flush out and clean the whole system um, and then, you know, use it. If you have water sitting in there for a really long time, that water could potentially get bad because those tanks are never going to be 100% clean. But it's fine to sit in there for you know, a number of weeks, uh, that's okay. 
Um, yeah. All right. A, deioni a deionizer removes mineral from the water. Yeah. So the the reverse osmosis membrane is going to actually remove most of the stuff from the water. Um, so you're actually going to want to put minerals back in the water. If this is your only drinking source. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question here from Lawrence who bought his boat six years ago, very, with a very posh water maker in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've looked at it with total confusion for six years without you using it. I tried to get it working, but it leaked from high pressure pump, sell it, yeah. repair it, throw it in skip. Well, it's hard to say the answer to that without seeing it, but leaks on water makers are, are really common. It's oh, water. Yes. It's going through a lot of different connection points. If you would have seen the amount of water I had to deal with during the week that I installed ours, you, in fact, I'll tell this story. I was working underneath the sink, trying to attach the freshwater flush system, which we haven't talked about. Uh, and it was just leaking. I couldn't kind of figure it out. And Sophie was at her computer at the SETI working, but her back was to me. And uh, I had her pressurize the system and she went back to working and I'm under there and there's water coming out, but it's just a so slow. So I'm uh, so not using my brain. I took a wrench under pressure, which I should have never done and tried to tighten one of the <laughs> quick connectors, which, which broke immediately. And uh, water was just, whoosh, and it was like something in a comedy movie. I was sitting there and water was just, and I was, shut it off, shut I it off. I had my and, headphones on and I was editing and I did not hear. Sophie's anything. just sitting there editing while in the background, yeah, 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 just water. <laughs> Anyways, um, so the point is, leaks, back, back to this, leaks, leaks are going to happen, happen, especially if it's, if it's six years old and it hasn't been used, stuff is, the rubbers start getting hard, they might crack the seals. So you could you could maybe take it you know just work it a little bit try to tighten up the connections see if that works um for sure the membrane the the reverse osmosis membrane is bad so you're gonna need to get a new one and replace that um but what i would probably suggest is getting somebody that knows that particular systems a mechanic or somebody locally and have them look at it and tell you if it's worth it and if it's if it's if, you, if you're going to spend you know thousand dollars in seals and parts it may be better just to deep six it and go on your own so uh yeah you have to evaluate that but the leaks are can be common okay okay Anything we else? have oh yeah we have a lot of questions after the water exits the system does it need to be treated i.e chlorine etc i made a little note here in the chat but guys do not put chlorine in your water makers it's going to kill them well i think so yeah that's true um chlorine and the reverse osmosis membranes is really bad we're going to talk about that here in a second but yep. uh so when that water comes out of the i think i just said it but when that water comes out of the membrane it's really really clear it's 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 just better than it's better than the drinking water in stockholm which is supposed to be some of the best in the world so you don't need to add anything to it. Um, if you clean your tanks, you're going to be fine. Um, now this might be a good segue into the, the flush system. After you have run your water maker, um, there's, there's salt water, like kind of all piled up in the, the back part of the system. You're going to want to flush, flush it out with fresh water. Uh, the reason to do that is it kind of preserves the long, the longevity of the membrane. It just protects the system in case you're not using it. So let's say, I, I said at the beginning of the the um, the live that the water makers need to be used, you know, like once every few days to keep them healthy. If you don't use them, the membranes are going to start to go bad. One way around that, if you're not going to use your membrane for a week or so, is just just to freshwater flush it every few days. Yep. So we do two things: we freshwater flush it after each use. And then we also freshwater flush it every three or four days. Um, so how that system essentially works, if you're following along on a, the graph here, yeah, is that's actually a question that we get if we have a process to reverse the flow yeah. of water to flush the system. So it doesn't yes, reverse do. the flow. We're just adding to it. So it what we do is we essentially tap into our house water system, and the water flows through a carbon filter. And what the carbon filter is there to do is to reduce any or eliminate any chlorine that's in the system. So if Sophie and I were at a marina for a period of time 
Uh, a lot of city tap water also contains chlorine. Uh, some parts of the world is much stronger than others. That carbon filter is going to eliminate that before we fresh water flush it. Because if we do with the chlorine, it's going to it's going to kill our membrane. So our system just takes that through a carbon filter and then through a, it's just a basic water timer, like a hose timer that you might have in your house. Um, and so we can set. I yeah. think that you need to remove our little um, video because people uh, can't see it just the says, bottom part. Yeah, it's just a freshwater flush box, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a little difficult to do that now, but uh, fresh, okay. the fresh, so that's just a timer. And what's great about that is I can set that to run like every three days uh, for five minutes. And so if I forget to run the fresh rod flush, it will just automatically do it for me. So the water then just goes through a one-way valve and it's really important that it's a one-way valve. Otherwise, when you turn on your water maker, it will put salt water into your fresh water tanks because it's going to go back up along these lines and back through. The water timer is not going to stop it from flowing back. So you need to have a one-way valve there. Uh, and then the water is just going to flow up and around, back in through the free, through the pre-filters, and then through the high-pressure pump, and then through the membrane. You don't need to have the high-pressure pump on. You don't need to have any part of the water maker running. It's just literally going to push water through the system, kind of clean out all that salt, and you'll see that, that water being discharged over the side. So that's how we keep it clean. And that's, that's, well, that's one of the maintenance items. If you're going to be away from your boat for a long time, we've gone uh, up to a month with just using the freshwater flush running, uh, making sure it's in, we had water in the tanks and mm -hmm. just cleaned it. If you're going to be gone longer than that, there's a, a way to pickle. It's called pickling your water maker. Essentially what you do is you run a pickling solution. I don't even know what the chemical is in it. It's a little powder you mix into a bucket it sounds like vinegar almost it's not vinegar i got some in my eyes oh <laughs> that wasn't good. no it was just a bit so um and what all you do is just run that through the membrane and that kind of that helps store it for about i think you can last up to about six months is what they say mm -hmm. uh with that so you want to pickle that and that's how you store it and that's what we did on board polar seal before we left we pickle it hopefully it's good uh if we don't go back to polar seal in the next year or so i probably would just have to buy uh, a new membrane and they run anywhere between uh, two to four hundred dollars euros so that's what you'd be be looking at so that's how we have our whole system set up and that's kind of the maintenance that we do the filters i i tend to change just when i see them getting dirty i'm not on a particular schedule with them because it, it also depends on how dirty the water is that you've been uh running your water maker on which is which is a good note because you don't want to be running your if if you're in a marina or if you're in an anchorage and you look over the side and you see an oil slick on top of the water you don't want to be running your water maker there because these pre filters aren't going to take out the oil the reverse osmosis membrane will but you're going to destroy it in the process so you're going to get fresh water for a little while but you're going to ruin your membrane so don't don't run your water maker if the water in the marina or the harbor or the anchorage is, is suspect. Uh, we wouldn't run our water maker in marinas. We've done no, it. No, we've done it just to twice, test a couple things very quickly, but, but that's, that's it. That's it. We would not yeah. do it because you never know what's in there. Yeah. Uh, Arno asks, what is the life expectancy of the aero membrane? That's a good question. I've been told it can last up to 10 years if they're mm. taken care of really well. Um, We've also known people that have trashed their water maker membrane in like six months. Yeah, but that's because they didn't pickle it. No, they just didn't. Yeah, they just didn't maintain it right. Yeah. So it's all up to the user, really, how you want to treat that thing. Um, a lot of people are really particular about it because they are expensive filters. But in my mind, I mean, you spend a few hundred euro for new RO membrane. It provides you with so much. I don't I don't get so we treat ours right, but I don't get so concerned about that that cost. Uh, what I do care about really making sure it's in good shape is the pumps and the motors. Um, so yeah, we're getting quite a few uh, questions about our system and how we maintain it. Uh, how do we clean the system? Yeah, so that freshwater flush is really the way that we clean it. So we you can clean it a few ways. You you change the filters out. So you always keep a, a stock of twenty mi. We keep a stock of twenty micron, five micron, and carbon filters. Mm -hmm. I think I usually keep three or four of each on board. Yeah. And then we, we freshwater flush it. 
Uh, somebody will probably ask, is it worth keeping an extra RO membrane on board? And I would say the answer is no, because they also have a shelf life. They yes. need to be used. So they're in a, you're, they'll arrive, they're in a package, there'll be some water, some moisture in it that's, that's perfectly fine. They need that so they don't dry out. But if you let it sit on a shelf for three years, it's going to be bad before you even put it in. So I don't think that that's worse. That, and you can usually find RO membranes most part of the world. And if not, you can get them shipped in pretty quick. Yes. Jules asks, how do we know when we need to change our filters? You will know <laughs> by looking at them, you know, the color, is it white? Is it black? Is it really black? Yeah. I usually just go based on color. I go down and check them once a week and see. And if somebody has a more scientific piece of advice on how often you need to change your water filters, you're welcome to enlighten this community in the chat section. Yeah. The low pressure gauge will also give you some indications too. Cause if, if you're not getting good water flow because the filters are clogged up, the pressure is going to go down that low pressure gauge. So just keep that. In. That's another reason it's there. Yeah. Uh, Bruno asked this apart from the membrane, do you replace other parts on a regular basis? Thinking mostly about pipes, rubber joints, seals. No, the it's, it's a pretty simple system if you just take care of it. So the only thing I replaced is, is the filters, uh, really. Um, we've added some things to it. Uh, oh, I haven't, I haven't changed the screen yet, but, uh, here I've, we've added a little control panel, which, um, you guys at home haven't seen yet because we haven't made a video on it, but we, we simplified things. So I wouldn't have to go down into the locker to turn stuff on. Uh, and that's been really nice, but, um, but no, other than that, we, we've never had to change pipes or things or anything. The, the, uh, for a, a maintenance thing, sometimes we've changed things around just to clear some space or have it uh, rigged a little differently. But no, it's just it's just the filters and making sure you fresh water flush the system. Yep. Here is a good question from Sea Heroes Sailing. Can you also pickle your water maker by putting the pickling solution in your fresh water tank and then use the water timer flush? Yeah, you could do that. I don't know. You, you want to be able to use that tank, obviously. And a lot of people then will, uh, when they pickle it, they'll pickle the, they'll pickle the membrane because that's the piece that you're protecting. And then they'll flush out all the water from the rest of the lines. So I think the best thing to do would be just to use a bucket. That's what most people do and just disconnect one of the lines and pop it in the bucket. If you get, if you get creative with your system, you can make another valve that only opens and it just has a a line on it so you can just stick it in a bucket when it's time to pickle but we did not do that i guess we did all right dave asked how do you stop the flush water from entering the system again after the arrow the fresh water yes um it's not a problem if it runs in the system again no or it, it really something no it really shouldn't because uh it, here if i pull up my diagram again um the fresh water is coming out of the RO membrane here and it's going along this blue path and la 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 and it goes into this fresh water tank. Now um, from there this is where it might get confusing because it can enter the house system and go through the fresh water flush system but the water timer uh, is the thing that stops it. So if that water timer hasn't activated that water timer is essentially like a tap uh, that you open and close it's just on a timer. Um, so if that's not on, if that hasn't activated, the fresh water won't go back through the system. That's the thing stopping it. It's no problem if fresh water goes back through there, but the way that it's designed in this chart, it, it just won't because that water timer stops that from happening. So I hope that answers the question. Uh, all right. We have, uh, I really like this, uh, comment from Lifen who said that at six years old, even brand new and unused, most water makers would, would need to get a rebuild kit or at least all new gasket and o rings. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good point worth mentioning that yeah. the, the motors and for the pumps on there probably will need to have gaskets and o rings replaced after like five or six years. Uh, so even our water high pressure pump does have rebuild kits for that. Um, and same with the seals, uh, the rings that are on the pressure vessel 
end caps they'll probably need to be replaced so those those are like long-term maintenance items but like on a weekly level it, it's not something you you would need to do but that's that's a really good point yeah yeah uh heidi and franny asked uh their ts meter batteries goes out from time to time and it takes does it take watch batteries? Oh, I have no, no idea. idea. <laughs> We've never tried that. <laughs> I don't the, uh, the, the water timer is actually uh, used with batteries and nuts have gone out for us, but luckily the default mode for it is closed. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise our, it would just drain our tanks. So that that one, so that's, that is something you gotta keep track. I have no idea. I guess it's a watch battery. I, don't know. I, have no I guess clue. it depends on the TDS meter. Do we need, we have, we have another, do we need to, recalibrate the tds meter now and then so there are ways apparently to to calibrate tds meters and i think it depends how advanced yours is but and you can buy kits i think you can buy kits on like amazon where you can they they know how much salt for water and blah blah, blah and you can test it but i i haven't seen a function on the, the tds meter that we have to calibrate it but i know that some do so there, there are ways to do that and i guess whatever tds meter that you decide to get uh, would have instructions on how to do that because there's many of them out there mm -hmm. and uh i oh yeah no this is yeah this was a question that we get that was really good that it's not 100 percent related to the water maker topic but yes it is uh when we were crossing the atlantic we had an incident during which our water maker was not working anymore but it was not related to the water maker but still it was not working and that was a pain in the ass do you want to talk about that and the question is, if we have reassessed with tools and spares, you will have we will have a board going forward. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about that incident because it's a it's a really good lessons learned. So that incident happened because Ryan crimped the cables for the high pressure pump incorrectly. Yes. Uh, actually. I don't know. I didn't crimp it wrong. I mean, but the crimper wasn't good. And as some of you who follow our videos know, um, we had an issue with the crimps on our lithium batteries as well. So it, it really came down to the crimper. We have since bought mechanical crimpers. So like they're just big levers that we can do things with. And we do carry the spares. Um, so we can make those repairs underway. Um, we during the crossing we assessed we just it was so close to shore and we could have like diy to fix and i probably would have if we would have had crew but there's so 60 amps going through a power line like that is a lot of it's a lot of current going through and it can produce a lot of heat so i just made the decision we looked at how much water we had in the tanks and how much bottled water we had and i just decided like it, it just it wasn't we had the water we needed it wasn't worth me DIYing it just so we could take a, a longer shower one day. So that was kind of my risk assessment of it. And that's what happened. It was just a bad crimp. The water maker itself was fine. And actually that crimp, uh, it was good that it happened because it explained some problems we were having with the motor while we were underway and making water. So all is fine now. Crimps are made. Things we have, work. We have a new crimper. We have a new crimper. So yes, we have reassessed. Well, we have a crimper. It goes up to 50 mil squared. We could use a bigger one to the bigger cabling, which is actually the, the problematic But yes, we have reassessed what tools we have on board. And the crimper turned out to be something that we needed more than we thought, mostly because we started to do some work. We did a lot of work with a bad crimper. Yeah. And we had to do a lot of crimps. And well, it turned out that a lot of the crimps that we had done on boat were bad. So it's it was worth having a, a big hydraulic crimper on board. Yeah. And I mean, we have a crimper on board. This is off topic, but we have a crimper on board because I do all of our electrical work, except I don't do a lot of AC work, but I do all of our DC work. So for me, and I do so many upgrades that it's just like worth having it, but other people may not yes. need that type of tool. So but, when you install your water maker, make sure that your crimps are right on uh, on the electric part of the installation. Yeah, it's a uh, big lesson. That'd learned. be good. That'd be helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So what about oil in the high pressure pumps? Do we need to change it very often? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. The, the, there'll be oil in the high pressure pumps. Um, I think I changed mine after 50 hours and then I, I kind of just do it on a 50. Well, here, I, what I typically do is I do it after 50 hours and then I typically just change it whenever I'm doing a engine 
change, oil change. Now, if you don't use your engine a lot, you may want to do a lot, but that's like, you might want to change your oil in the motor, um, there, I'm sorry, in the pump more, but that's like kind of how I gauge that because I like using our engine. <laughs> so I do it about everything Aaron is else. a very engine happy person. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Were there any other mistakes or any other lessons learned that we had along the way? I, I can probably, I can probably name a few. Okay, then you name One a few. of them was we were in Sicily, uh, it's an anchorage called, uh, what was it called? It was Ortigia, but Syracuse, right. And there is oh. a big lagoon when, where there are a lot of boats on anchor and the water is really murky. And for so the water was really stagnant and it was really shallow. And I think that normally we try to make water in a little deeper, yeah. deeper depth when we're on anchor. Uh, or we tried to make water on their way. And this time the water was so bad that everything that came out on the other side of the arrow membrane uh, had a really strong smell of sulfur that uh, persisted for a couple of months, actually, uh, even after we continued to make water with uh, once we had left Syracuse yeah. in Sicily. And I think that was a big lesson to learn for us about where we choose to make water, uh, what anchorages we choose to make water. Um, when we ended up in San Martin during the lockdown, we had no choice but to run water maker in the same type of waters, very shallow, lots of sewage, not a lot of flow, lots of boats, because everybody was on lockdown. We didn't have the problem of smell, but, um, but yeah, I do remember the strong smell. If it's not a waters where we would normally have. Yeah, we had the smell in our tanks for a while. It took a, it took quite a while to get it out, but we eventually got it out and yeah. it was okay. And the the membrane still works well. Uh, I don't know, like other mistakes I made. I or things that we've learned on the way. Yeah, I. I think that pro this project actually went fairly well, other than the fact that when you're doing it and you build your own, like you just need to understand you're going to get a little wet. Yes, there uh, are some reality checks. Yeah. And one of them is that it's probably going to be easier to install an on, off the shelf, like a Rainman, an Ecotech, or a Spectra, Maybe, yeah. than building your own. Because, well, first off, you're going to have to think of all the, the placement of all the parts. Yeah. Uh, so for us, we put the membrane on one side of the boat and you design a little, a specific little casing for it. Then you designed a little panel where you had all your parts connected to each other with all the lines running. Uh, so you did spend a lot of time thinking about how you were going to place all of those elements. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it takes some time to place it and then once connecting, uh, you know, and then, you know, you may, oh, I need a part that does this. You got to go to Chandler and find it. Maybe you don't have it and you got to order it. Um, Three-way valves were, at least in Europe, were incredibly difficult to find. Uh, I don't know why that is. I think they're a little bit easier in the U.S. So those are the things. But I think just the biggest lesson was just really take your time when you're trying to figure out where everything goes. Plan a few days to do it. And, and then put it in and you're going to get, you're going to get a little wet. You get a little frustrated, but it's, it's good. And it will be the same if you try to install your own off the shelf yes. system too. So anytime you install a water maker, we've learned you're going to take a shower. I don't think <laughs> that there is, if there is a way around that, or if you guys manage to install your water maker without taking a shower, uh, we, we need to send you a pole seal hat. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it's typically an installation that will, there's going to be leaks. You know, testing the water maker means that you're going to be chasing the leaks and correcting the leaks. One thing that you've been doing when you install the water maker is that sometimes you tighten the connections a little too much and they broke. Yeah, that happened a few times, uh, but luckily, since they're all pretty standard parts, I had a bunch of spares, so we just flop them out real quick. Yeah. What, what happened with that was that like I installed some of them when it was cold, colder outside and when it got hot in the summer in the med, they, everything expanded and started breaking. So that was um, that was a lesson learned, but generally, yeah, this project went smooth. But I really had spent a lot of time planning it out. Yes, I 
also remember, and that's I think a big shout out to DIY watermaker systems because when that happened, I remember that you tighten one of the filter casing too much and it broke. Mm. And we had to go back to the hardware store to buy more filters. I think that we went to the hardware store twice that day. Yeah. Um, and but we could, we could do it. We just go yes. to a hardware store and buy the, the part instead of calling exactly. a name brand company to send us a proprietary filter housing. Yes. And that's, that's a great thing about it. Yeah. Which is super nice because literally everywhere we go in the world, we can go to the hardware store and pick parts that we need for our water maker. And we do not need to care about the brand, about sometimes even about the size. Like it's, they all are a bit different types, but they work and we can always make water. So, uh, so when those case broke, it was really easy to replace them. Yeah. So, so uh, Alan just wrote, I just saw a comment here uh, suggested adding an hour meter on the water maker panel. That's a great idea. Yeah. We don't have one on there. I've thought about it for a long time, um, but you can buy just very basic hour meters that will run when, when there's power connected to them. Uh, so that is a good idea. You can just keep track of that. Uh, and then Jules asks, how much swearing should he budget for in the install? Yeah, I was actually and, answering uh, that. And, uh, uh, you uh, cannot have a swearing budget because you will end up broke. I would say medium. Uh, medium <laughs> swearing budget. That's That would be good. Uh, so whatever. Because everyone's swearing, swearing is different. Their budget's different. Uh, let's see here. Is couldn't there... you have you, your dis you, couldn't you have dissolved some sodium bicarbonate in your tank to remove the other? Uh, I have no idea. I never used that. I don't know. That's, we eventually got it that's out, a good but <laughs> luckily we hadn't made a lot of water before I realized what was happening. Yes. Do we have water alarms or do we always run the monitor? Uh, we always monitor the system when it's running. We, that is a brilliant question. We generally monitor the system or someone's on the boat while it's it's running, but we don't. I think we've gotten more and more confident with the system as it's as we've gone on. So like, and the motor sound, like you kind of get to know, it's just like anything on a boat. You get to know the sounds and the vibrations yes. and things. There've been a few times the motor does something totally funny. Both Sophie and I are like, wait, and we go and it's like, maybe it's okay. Or sometimes it's like the output just drops and we just shut it off and figure out what's going on. Yes. But, uh, so that's kind of how we monitor it is just by listening to it. Uh, Cause it is really just that high pressure pump that you, but you know, I'll, I'll go down and like maybe when running it for an hour or two, I'll go down three or four times and just check the TDS meter uh, and make sure it's still relatively low. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Do we want to talk about that time when you didn't know that it had switched the water tanks and we overfilled? Well, I don't know if that's not so specific to water makers, but yeah, Sophie switched the water tanks one day and. I had the water That's maker. A general reminder. I had the water maker. She didn't tell me, so I had the water maker running for like three hours, and then I finally realized it. I went outside, and we had literally just been making water and pushing over the side of the boat. It caused other problems because the tank leaked a bit, and then we got water all in the bilge, and oh, it was such a mess. It's still a mess, but yes. So make sure you tell your other if you switch the tank, so they know. Dave asked us uh, the company that we use to buy our kits and we we loved working with them. It's a Seawater Pro. Uh, yeah, and it's probably, I, I mean, just to be fair to everybody, it is worth noting that we did get a deal on our kit when we we uh, bought it. Uh, we did pay for the kit, um, but yes. we did get a little bit of an incentive. And it was, we actually didn't know what we were doing when we bought it, but we, we said we would fil <laughs> film it and do it. And in the process, we actually really fell in love with with it and the idea of doing it so um yeah but seawater pro is who we seawater pro they're great if we were to do it again build another water maker would we go through them 100 percent? yeah think. absolutely because yeah. Uh, it takes so much time uh off the installation because you don't have to figure out where to get all the parts you just get the kit and uh, it's brilliant they have great customer service mm -hmm. um yeah so 100 percent. if we on policy on number two when we get uh, another boat and we need to build a water maker, I think that we'll go for the exact same solution and maybe we would add another membrane. Uh, maybe, That's yeah. probably what we would do. I don't think we would buy a name brand. I think that we would continue to uh, to go on DIY solutions. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just too good. So, uh, yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, my I guess my expanding on that comment a bit is that it's just so easy to fix something if something breaks while you're out so 
because we've I've tried to help other people with their name brand water makers that have problems and usually I can figure out what's going on with it but I can't get the part because it's a special part or it's proprietary or something and then you're just left with well you got to call the customer service so that sucks um oh sometimes you can find little little replacements one uh, I just saw a question about a pressure relief valve there are um systems that have pressure relief valves built in. So if something happens with the membrane, you don't blow the whole system up. Uh, you just <laughs> spew water all over the place. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, so that's an option if you want some extra protection is putting in a pressure relief valve. Yes. Did we mount our motors on damper blocks to curb the vibration sound? Yeah. Do we have them? I had considered putting the whole thing on damper blocks and I didn't at the advice of Seawater Pro actually, and it turns out really didn't. This is with a DC pump. Uh, I really didn't need it. Uh, it's loud, but it doesn't, they're so well balanced. It doesn't really vibrate uh, much. So I didn't really need the expense and the, the trouble of doing it. So you could do it, but I don't think it would change much. It'd just be out of expense. So yeah, my view. Um, the material that our tanks are made from, thoughts on lighters. Our tanks are plastic. Yeah, our tanks are plastic, but I think they're describing a uh, like a uh, a bladder that's like made out of a bag type material. Oh, yeah, um, I see. yeah people use bladders. We actually have a small one that we had originally bought for as a like a shower or pull a shower that can oh. heat up. Uh, and I know that some people use bladder on really long crossings, but if your water maker works, you probably wouldn't need that. So um, I, I don't. I'm not like a materials expert, so I don't know if how. You know what that does the quality of it mm -mm. So, i don't have much to say on that i think yeah because <laughs> i don't know we yeah. are approaching the two hours limit yeah. of this chat and i think that uh questions or uh we don't have we i think that we've answered all the questions if you have any more questions about i think i think there's a final point i can leave everybody with is that what, which what i've been trying to say throughout this whole live is that this system is really simple so I knew nothing about water makers a year and a half ago when Sophie and I decided like, okay, maybe it's worth getting a water maker. And then we looked at the, the expense of it. We're like, oh, we don't have $7,000 for like a special water maker. We, like it would be really beneficial, but what do we do? And then I said, well, what is a water maker? So just a little bit of research and a little bit of confidence in yourself. You can do this. You can build this yourself and you can maintain it yourself. And it's going to be, it's going to be really good. And it's going to save you a lot of money. And in the end, it will probably save you just some maintenance hassle. So you can do this no matter what your experience is. You can do this. Um, and we're, we're always here for people if they have questions or whatnot. So um, just be confident if it's something you're looking at. And I, I really do believe that, you know, yeah. anybody can put it. And there is a big value to having a water maker if your sailing needs require it. Yeah, we're having some really cool knowledge in the chat. Uh, so Philip said, I pickled my catadine water maker with sodium metabdiesulfite sulfite dis dissolved uh, in arrow or distilled water. Sodium mm -mm, is cheap and available. Uh, Doe uses it to pickle new arrow membrane. However, you should never use them, uh, use it with a spectra water maker because it invalidates the warranty. That's that's pretty specific. Uh, mm -hmm. We never own the Spectra, so there is no way we could know that. Uh, and Eric asked, I was just looking at Water Pro, and so portable units, have we ever looked into those? We never, uh, I mean, obviously we've seen them. Uh, we talked, Seawater Pro makes them, uh, this other company, Rain Man, makes them. Um, we didn't really consider a portable unit because I wanted to have something installed in the boat that I could just flip a switch. I don't have to crawl in, pull lines and cables out. Um, so I did not consider that. However, if you're on a smaller boat or in a smaller budget, or you don't need to make that much water, they, they do have a place and they do make sense. So um, and I, whoever you buy it from, I'm sure, you know, it's all the same, it's all the same parts. Uh, but uh, yeah, so if you're on a smaller boat, you just want a little system that you can run, you know, once in a while, it could, could work. All right. Anything else that you guys want to know or that we can uh, talk, say about our water maker? Man, I I think I've I think I've covered it. I am um, I'm glad that the whole tech thing has worked. We're gonna try to expand on it even more 
for the next time, I wanted to have the ability to like. Oh, you're talking about a live decision. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. To to drive some points home and show some graphs and and uh, well, I think it's going to be needed for some of the future tech talks. So, if anyone has any idea for tech talks, uh, we've had a few come in since our last one, and they're always really good, and it's given us some ideas of things to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, the next tech talk we're going to have is not going to be next week. Uh, next weekend yes. is Fourth of July in the U.S., and it is my favorite holiday in the entire world. So. I'm going to be celebrating that actually with uh, the crew 59 North. So we're excited about that. And uh, we'll be back the weekend after. And we're going to be talking about electric, your electrical needs on board. And I'm yes. still scoping that out with the full scope that's going to be, but it's going to be really assessing your needs and how big your battery pack should be and other charging systems. And then we'll get into more things, but it will, the electrical part will probably be a multi session piece but it also gives me a few weeks to put it together <laughs> yeah uh in the meantime i am not sure how much videos i will be able to put out because i do not have a laptop anymore and it's probably going to take me a week before i can get my hands on a new one uh ironically it, this is just the time that i had started to work with an editor <laughs> on a ryan stack uh, corner video and yesterday so right before the laptop crashed uh, I had managed to send over all the material for her to edit. So maybe we managed to get a uh, Ryan Tech Corner about a uh, high power alternator next week, but I don't know yet. So uh, that'll be a good one. So hopefully we get it out. So if you could just bear with us for a little bit until while I get we this get the computer laptop thing. issue sorted, guys. Thank you again so much for the super chat. Uh, I, re I really had a little bit of a moment there. It's really not something that I wanted to deal with or that I, I could afford right now, but it needs to happen. Uh, no, you guys have been great. We, we really, we, for us, we want to make our knowledge and our experience available for, for you guys who like to embrace it and see what we're up to. And for us, that's, that's just a big thing. And we get to meet so many of you. And so asking for something back from our community is, is always really hard. Um, but we, yeah. we thank everybody who has just helped us out during this because uh, it all takes a lot of time and it does take some pretty expensive equipment. So we really, really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. So, um, if you have any other questions about water makers or, or anything else we've talked about in tech talks, you can email us or put it in the comment section below and we'll answer. Yes. Uh, but yeah, I think we'll wrap it up for now, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Until next time. We, uh, you yeah, can do, do we, it. Are we, are we gonna, are we gonna close it now? I think so. Oh my yeah. God. It's always a little hard when we uh, end those streams because I, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to end. It's like, oh, it's so much fun going out. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for hanging out with us this afternoon. And uh, we will see you soon. Uh, you can find us. Oh, thanks, Josie, for the super chat. That's awesome. <laughs> thanks, guys.